time. You know what I mean? Like waiting in line. I hate waiting in line. Uh, that's what's so cool about a smartphone. I was really excited once I got a smartphone because that meant waiting in line was now purposeful. <laughs> I could play a game, I could text, I could call, I could do whatever I wanted to waiting in line. How about sitting in traffic? Sitting in ta- traffic, total waste of time, but now that there's podcasts and you have music on your phone, it's not too bad, but I cannot stand sitting in traffic. It, it, it drives me insane. I'm one of those guys, if there's a, a car pulls up to the left and there's an open spot, I'll drive in it, but then that lane gets backed up. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It is the laws of the universe. <laughs> Whenever you switch lanes, things slow down. Uh, how about this? And maybe it's for some of the younger people watching YouTube videos or Instagram videos. Your life is wasted. You're like, how did I just spend the last three hours in bed watching videos all night? <laughs> I'm so tired. I should have done something else. Total waste of time, right? How about constantly checking your social media? It could be a total waste of time. Thinking about what others might think of you can be a total waste of time. How about worrying, right? You guys ever late in bed, late at night, worrying about what's going to happen, what you're going to do? There's lots of things that we can worry about, and I think that that just wastes our time. And then finally, I think what can waste your time is living in the past. When you live in the past and you let the past dominate the present and the future, Um, you're wasting your time. And time is precious. Time is valuable to us. And I don't know about you, but I like to do things that are worth my time. And something that really speaks to me about the Christmas story is that something that is very much worth my time is getting to know God. Getting to know God. And I really think that is one of the most powerful messages about the Christmas story is that Jesus being born of a virgin, God with us, Emmanuel, it is about us being able to know God, and that God is worth knowing. God is worth knowing. And so when it comes to our time, our talents, our money, our energy, whatever it is that encompasses us as a person, when it comes to getting to know God, God is worth it. You know, every day we are confronted with decisions uh, about whether or not we're going to waste our time or whether or not our time is going to be valuable. And each and every one of us have a balance scale in our minds. And I have a picture for you about what an ancient balance scale would look like. A lot of us uh, know what a balance scale is today. Um, Piper's giving me an amen back there. That's right, little girl. But uh, everyone, uh, all of us know what a balance scale is, right? You put maybe something like gold on one side, and then you measure out the weight for the other. And so what I want you to do this morning is I want you to picture knowing God is on one side of the scale, and what is it that could equal out the other side? What is it that is worth getting to know God, experiencing him personally? And that's something that each of us will have to come to a decision on. So we're talking about the idea of worth this morning. Worth can simply be defined a few different ways. What is due, the due reward, properly assigning value, Uh, one who has merited anything, I think really the question that comes to my mind is this, is it worthwhile? And so we're going to use the balance scale this morning, and the first thing that I want to bring to you is simply this, is that God is worth knowing, so he came to us. I mean, we are talking about the creator of the universe. God the creator is worthy to receive our recognition, our time, our honor, our glory, our adoration, our praise, He's worth it all because he is the creator. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. When we look out at creation and we see this big, majestic, powerful, immensely intelligent being that has created the universe for us and he came down into that universe so that we could get to know him, that is an amazing thing. He is so very powerful He is personal because there's design in the universe. He is moral. We all know what is right and wrong in our own hearts. And yet, God chose to come, not only to know us, but that we might know him. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says this, Worthy are you, Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. But I think there's a reality that we've all experienced. I mean, think about it. Not everybody uh, celebrates Christmas. And even those who do actually celebrate Christmas Day, we are all here, not everyone celebrates getting to know God. And there are a few different ways that people have this opportunity 
to know God and to experience him personally, but they choose to reject him. I think Herod, right? King Herod chose to reject getting to know God in the flesh. In fact, he sanctioned the murder of innocent children after he found out this rival king of Israel was going to be born. There's a scripture in Psalms chapter 14, verse 1. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. God is worth knowing, but people reject his knowledge. How about ignorance? Right? Some people, they believe there's a higher being, they believe there's something out there, but they remain willfully ignorant. They don't really try to seek and find God. The Bible says, some have no knowledge of God, and to this uh, I speak of your shame. When Isaiah was talking to the nation of Israel about knowledge of God and whether or not God was worth your time, whether or not God was worth listening to a sermon instead of being on your phone or hanging out at the house, Isaiah said this, For a fool speaks nonsense and in his heart inclines toward wickedness to practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord. To remain willfully ignorant of who God is, man, it's a waste of time. Count your time as worthy to get to know God. But then I think about another way people don't really know God, and that's neglect. Psalms 10.4 says, The wicked and haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him, and his thoughts are, there is no God. And we could go through a lot of scriptures this morning about the problem with humanity, that there is something in us that struggles to want to know our creator. It's, it's like a double-edged sword. We want to know God, but it's hard work to get there. Or there might be things in our life that prevent us from knowing God, roadblocks that hinder us from knowing God more. Paul put it like this in Romans 121. He says, for even though they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, for some of us, it would seem so counterintuitive to be able to have access to the creator of the universe and not take advantage of that opportunity. The greatness of God, his power, his wonder, his majesty. And you know what? God gave up so very much so that we could know him. There are a few of my favorite Christmas passages that I'm going to show with you now. One of them is is a very famous passage. It's in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And I want you to read along with me because this is very powerful. Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus was born, before God and the flesh would come to us. And look at what Isaiah predicts. He says, for unto us a child will be born, a son will be given. Look at the magnitude of this person. And the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. I don't know if you know this, but Isaiah and the people of Israel at that time, they were going through some of the most horrendous things that you could ever endure. Their people were being carried off to slavery. They were enduring such great persecution. Their spiritual leaders were drunkards and sexually immoral. I mean, they were totally bankrupt of God. And yet Isaiah looks out in the future and he says, even though we're going through this troublesome time now, there is going to come a day where a baby will be born and he will be God with us. We will finally know who God is. We will finally know what it's like to walk and talk and live with the Lord. And then we pick up this story. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read the fulfillment of this prophecy of Christmas Day the day that Jesus was born, and the excitement, and the worthiness, and the adoration that came along with that. And we're going to pick up this story in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, where Mary is probably out tilling the fields, or or gleaning, or serving her family in some way, shape, or form, and all of a sudden, I don't know how you would feel if an angel popped in front of you, but it would really scare me, okay? We're not used to that. And so here is Gabriel, and he comes down to Mary, and look what he says. In verse 28, it says, And coming in, he, which is Gabriel, said to her, Mary, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. I mean, can you imagine being the woman who has the honor to give birth to the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior? I mean, they had read Isaiah 9, 6. They had looked forward to the hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament. And now here's Gabriel getting ready to break the good news to a poor little woman probably 14, 16 years old. And he says, look, you are favored. You are honored. 
In verse 29 it says, but she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. I would be wondering, but like, what is going on right now? Verse 30, it says, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and his kingdom will have no end. Here is a guy who's going to be born, who is going to sit on the throne, who is going to rule, who is going to have a kingdom that never ends. And verse 34 says, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Matthew gives us a little bit more information. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, it says, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save the people of from their sins. Not only did God view the world worthy of coming down into flesh, but he viewed us worthy as being a king who saves us from our own sins. It says in verse 22, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates God with us. I want you to think about this. You guys are going to go home. You're going to have Christmas lunch. We're going to have Christmas dinner, uh, fried chicken, uh, mm, fried chicken, mashed potatoes, corn, gravy, green beans. And can you imagine God showing up on your front door? I mean, think about that for a moment. God comes knocking on your door and he says, hey, I'm here to have dinner with you. What would you expect? Would you expect him to bring a housewarming gift? I certainly want it. I mean, it's God, right? What an honor. Um, would you expect him to bring a covered dish? Certainly not. How can I serve you? What can I do to make sure that you're comfortable? I mean, it would be a typical, you know, like visit, but I mean, this is God who we're talking about. He's going to eat fried chicken with me. I mean, this is great. I mean, think about that for a moment. What kind of honor would it be for God to come and have dinner with us? That would be amazing. I mean, if we would think about like the president of the United States or a famous athlete or, or somebody that we really respected just wanted to come and spend time with you, that would be incredible. And yet, this is what God does, and even more so. I mean, he is coming down to spend time with us. What an honor. And so the second thing that we're talking about this morning is that God is worthy because he gave. What would you be willing to give for the person sitting in front of you? Not beside you, your husband, wife, son, or daughter, but the person sitting inside of, in front of you. If, if they said, hey, look, I need a $500 uh, gift. I can't pay you back, but I need that. Would you give that to them? Some of you are like, absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, think about that for a moment. What would you give if they asked to exchange their debt for yours? Would you do it? What if they needed an organ transplant? Would you be willing to give up a part of your body so that the person in front of you could live? Or let's take it to the ultimate extreme. Would you be willing to exchange your life for theirs? That would be an incredible thing to do. But most of us, when somebody asks to borrow 20 bucks, we're like, ah, I don't know. I really don't want to do that. And we do everything we can to avoid having to give part of ourselves to other people. And I think that's a part of our human nature, which is sinful. But when we look at what God gave, I mean, we often just get enamored with this story of Jesus and how he was born and how he died on a cross. But there is so very much that God gave. And I want to bless you with the opportunity to recognize that this morning. Here's the first thing that God gave us. Number one, his pre-existent status. He gave us his pre-existent status that you may be with him in the glory of eternity. I don't know if our, if our minds really fully recognize the status of God, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, all-loving, the king of the universe, the creator of the world, gave us his status. He took on the form of a human being so that we might spend eternity with him. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. And Paul kind of talks a little bit about what he gave, and he, this is how he explains it. Look at verse 6. It says, although he existed in the form of God, Jesus, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. 
taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross. You see, without the death on the cross, the birth doesn't matter. Without the resurrection, the birth doesn't matter. Without knowing Jesus as he is and fully what he gave for us, the Christmas story doesn't matter. It says that he didn't, requ- he didn't regard equality with God something to be grasped. Here's what that means, is that his status wasn't something that he was trying to earn. His status wasn't something that he was trying to gain. Jesus was God. Jesus was the Holy One. It wasn't something that he would have to try to steal from God or that he thought that it's something that he had to work for. That's who he was. That's why the miracle of Christmas is so amazing. It's because God took on flesh and he gave up his right to sit on the throne and he took on a human nature, a human soul, a human mind that he should redeem the creation. And in verse 7, I want you to picture it like this. When it says God emptied himself, a lot of people have this mistaken idea that God gave up divine power and divine knowledge, and that's not what it was at all. I want you to picture that the human nature veiled the powerfulness of God, right? When God took on a human mind, when God took on a human soul, he veiled his attributes. So as a baby boy, of course, right, he didn't allow himself to be all-knowing. As a young man, he didn't allow himself to be all-powerful. I mean, if I was God, because I'm a sinful person, I would click my fingers and let fried chicken be on the table right now. I don't know about you, but that's what I would do. I mean, think about this. Jesus is God. He could do whatever he wants. But yet, he willfully veiled everything that it meant to be God so that we could know him more. Think about that. We struggle maybe to give money or time or energy to the people around us or people we don't even know, and yet Jesus gave up his status. Jesus gave up his rights, his rights to be called God, his rights to be worshiped, his rights to be adored and praised and venerated and revered. God gave up all of those things to be subjected to what? Being born in a manger, being born to a poor woman and a poor man, a carpenter, being subjected to social persecution and rejection, and ultimately the abandonment of his friends and the most horrific crucifixion that we could ever imagine so that humanity could be saved. Not only a king who reigns, but a king who serves. That is the essence of a Christmas story. Have you ever seen Undercover Boss? Anybody? I like that show. Yeah, I like Undercover Boss. It's fun. But after a while, you kind of get it, right? I mean, it's the same thing. It's like a Hallmark Right, Jeff? It's like a Hallmark movie. Uh, You kind of get what's going to go on. Uh, Jeff made fun of me for watching a Hallmark movie. Anyways, I am unashamed, you know what I'm saying? Unashamed. But if you watch Undercover Boss, um, it's, it's, it's really cool. You have a CEO, right, the top dog in an organization, the most intelligent, the most powerful, has the ability to hire a fire, has the ability to grant a salary to whoever he or she wants. I mean, we're talking about the most powerful person in an organization, somebody like Google or Apple, right? Think of it like that. And you have this CEO, which gets changed, right? Maybe they'll dye their beard or their hair. They'll put a a mask on. They'll put makeup on. They'll dress in kind of like lowly clothing. And they'll go to one of their businesses and they'll act like they're a new employee doing some type of uh, video or some type of promo thing or a learning experience or something of that nature. So you've got the CEO who has the right to do whatever he or she wants, willing to come down to the low-level employee and work and learn and converse and talk and experience. Two different roles, right? The CEO and the low-level employee. And that they're willing to give up their time, their energy, their pride, so that they can make their business better, so that they can have a better experience for their employees, so that they can sympathize. And the, the part that makes me cry at the end, I'm sorry, yes, I do cry, is that when, when they give the person like either a bunch of money or an elevated job or they just totally bless their family and these people are working two jobs and they got four kids and they're barely making ends meet and they're great employees, right? And they give them this awesome gift at the end. God coming down in the flesh, that doesn't even compare to what God gave up and experienced for us. And that, my friends, is the Christmas story. God is so worthy 
of everything, of our praise, of our time, of our money, of our gifts. God is so very worthy of all of us because he gave. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says this, For by these predetermined plans, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. It was a promise for Jesus to be born. It was a promise for our sins to be wiped away. It was a promise, and it is a promise, for us to reign with him in the new heavens and the new earth. And it says, so that by these promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. This is something that completely blows my mind. And this whole idea of us thinking about God being worthy, God deserving, God having this right and this status that he rightfully does have, that God would count himself as unworthy to count us as worthy. That God would empty himself and veil himself because we were worth it. That God wanted us to experience him so very personally and intimately that he was willing to go through all of that, that we would experience and partake, as Peter says, of his divine nature to really, truly experience God as he is. I mean, I don't know about you, but that is one of the greatest gifts that I could ever imagine, that God would be willing to do that for me and for you personally. But he not only gave us his rights or his status, God gave us ultimately his life. Mark says this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We do service projects around here. We serve our families. A lot of you moms, grandmoms are going to be slaving in the kitchen, maybe dads, I don't know how your family is. But serving one another, giving each other gifts, blessing one another, that is why Christianity is the most radical religion, the most truthful religion, the most world-changing religion that could ever be fathomed. It is totally upside down. All other gods, all other religions demand something, and yet Christianity God says, I'm willing to give up everything for you, that we could be together. That, that is amazing. 1 John chapter 2, verses 2 through 3 says this, If anyone sins, we have an advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Propitiation means to exchange. He exchanged himself for our sins. It's like Christmas gifts, right? Sorry if you didn't get anybody a Christmas gift this year, and I know it might feel awkward. Uh, it happened to me this morning. Angel and I decided not to get each other gifts, and she pulled a fast one. She got me a gift. I said, I'm not accepting it. I'm sorry. Just kidding. I accepted it. You know me. No, I'm just kidding. No, it made it awkward. I mean, a gift exchange, you know, we're getting presents for everybody else and for Piper, and she gets me a gift this year, and God's given us a gift. Right? He has given us his son to exchange our sins for his life, but not only for ours, but for the entire world. This isn't just a Christian thing. This is an entire world thing. This is what God gave, his life, not only for us, but for everybody, for the entire world. What are we willing to give back to God? And then finally, God is worthy. He gave his status, he gave his rights, he gave his life, but something that you can take with you today that you can do this morning at your house as he has given us his word he has given us his word look god has given us so much to come down to be born of a virgin in a manger in a dirty stable to give up his life to be hunted and persecuted and forsaken and then he has given us his word that we may know him even more I mean, when we look out at the expanse of the heavens, when you look at the design of the universe, when you see the magnificence of the creation of the human body, you're like, wow, God is amazing. God is big. God is powerful. God is personal. And then he gives us his word that we may have knowledge of him. If you want to know God, if God is worth knowing to you, you will make a dedication to know him and talk to him every day by reading God's word every single day. That will help you know God. That will show that God is worth knowing to read the word every day. Colossians says this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Talking to Christians, he says, You are filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and then our key phrase, increasing in the knowledge of God. That is what his word does, to increase our knowledge of him that we may know him better. Is God worth knowing this Christmas? Yes, he is. Is God worth you taking your time today in the midst of giving presents, in the midst of eating delicious food and watching Christmas movies and football? Is God worth taking time with your family to read his word and know him more? Think about it like this. Any businessman, right, when you watch these undercover boss, or I like Shark Tank. Anybody watch Shark Tank? Yeah, Shark Tank's cool, right? They will say one of the most, their, their biggest assets is their time right? They could throw money on an investment. They could do whatever they wanted. They could make a person rich overnight. But one thing that they use as a bargaining chip in the room, right, is their time. They say, look, you're getting me. You're getting my counsel, my direction, and my time is very valuable. And God, through his birth, stepped into time to give time of himself. 33 years on this earth, And then he gives us his spirit who is with us always. God with us, Emmanuel. God has given us his time. Will you give time to God today and tomorrow and every day? Even if it's just a little bit, a little bit of time, God is worth it. And then thirdly and finally, we're going to conclude with that God is worthy because he reigns. I'm not a huge traveler. I used to think about traveling, you know, when I was younger and uh, now, you know, we have a child and church and jobs and house. And, and so I don't, I don't really travel that much. But if I had the opportunity, you know, I would travel a little bit. I'd go to London. Uh, I probably would see some, you know, the seven wonders of the world, things like that. But if you think about like this, how far would you be willing to travel um, to visit somebody that you're interested in? How far, you know, if it was a person? 3,000 miles? Would you travel halfway around the world? Would you go to Australia? Would you sit on a 14-hour flight? How much money would you be willing to invest in the travel expense? Um, I think, yeah, China, I would like to go to. I mean, there's some really beautiful parts of China. Australia, I think, would be really cool. I'd like to see the Hobbit world and New Zealand. I think that would be great. Uh, London, like like I said. I mean, I think these, yeah, I know, I'm I'm a nerd. Hobbit is cool. Don't Don't hate on it. Hobbit's cool. But I would probably do that, right? I would travel. I would travel. It would be fun. But more importantly, I'd like to stay home. But these are once in a lifetime opportunities. And I think what is really cool is that in the Christmas story, we find three, traditionally, three men or a group of men who are willing to travel a very long distance to celebrate the birth of Christ. We know them as the wise men or the magi, right? You guys know who I'm talking about. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. That God is worthy because he reigns. These magi, they were wise men. They were very intelligent people. They probably studied astronomy. Um, they studied Old Testament history. They were probably historians. I mean, these people were, were verifiably geniuses. And when they studied these Old Testament scrolls, they saw these Jewish predictions about a son that would be born um, in, the, in the proper time. And they were able to calculate throughout their lifetime that in corresponding with this star that would illuminate in the sky and their study of the scriptures, that this son would be born in Bethlehem, in Israel. And so they traveled a very far distance. We don't know exactly how, how long, but they traveled from the east to come see baby Jesus being born. I think this is cool, right? God put a physical recognition in the sky to correspond to a spiritual reality that God in the flesh would come and be born in a manger. And so we don't know whether or not these guys are practicing Jews. They're probably not. They're coming from the East. We don't know their historical background other than the fact that they're very, very smart. And so they're traveling a very long distance, giving up their time, giving up their energy, probably incurring certain types of dangers because God is worth it. God is worth their time. God is worth their travel. And look what it says in Matthew chapter 2. It says, starting in verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea and the days of, of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king, the king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. This is awesome. Where's the king? We want to worship him. Look at verse 9. After hearing the king Herod, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east 
went before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. So very neat. Look, if God can create the universe, can he control a star? Yes. If God can create the universe, can a child be born of a virgin? Yes. If God can pick up a 500-pound rock, is a 5-pound rock any problem? No. <laughs> People are like, I don't understand the virgin birth. How could God do such a thing? Well, he's God. He created the universe. He's all-powerful. It's not a problem. And so here's this child with this star, and it says in verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I mean, over a star, we see stars all the time, you know, but this star is special. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and they worshiped him. And then look at what they did. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Here's the king of the universe whose kingdom will never end, the eternal God who's established his kingdom here on the earth. And here are these magi who have calculated, who have studied probably their whole life for this amazing moment. And they come and they say, where is the king? Our intent is to worship him. Our purpose is to adore him. Our motivation is to seek him out. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He is so very worthy he was worthy of everything that they had to give, and they bowed down, and they rejoiced. And you should do that this Christmas day. Rejoice in your worship of God. Let the exchanging of your gifts be a recognition that God is good. Let the food that you eat be adoration to the gloriness of God that he has given us, his son. Let the time that you spend together be exceedingly and abundantly joyful this Christmas day as you celebrate the king who has been born and who has been recognized. I think these three gifts are really cool. And let me share a little bit of information about these gifts. Gold, first of all, obviously very valuable. It was a symbol of divinity. It was a symbol that God has come to know us. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, which represented the holiness of God, was made out of gold. And so it was natural and fitting that Jesus would be presented with the most precious material uh, that we have today, which is gold. That recognized his divinity. Number two was frankincense, which is a, a, a white resin or a gum. It looks, it's not what you think. It, it looks kind of like a stone. And it, it represented a fragrance of an offering given unto the Lord, right? It was pleasing unto God. They would go into the temple and they would burn this. And it would be a, a sweet, pleasing smell to the Lord. And so this frankincense here represented that Jesus willfully decided to act to offer himself as a holy and pleasing sacrifice to God. Frankincense. Gold and frankincense. God is present. God is offering himself. And then number three is myrrh. Myrrh is from Arabia. It was a fragrant spice that they would use in embalming or they would mix it with wine. This was the same type of drink that was offered to Jesus on his crucifixion and he turned his head away from it. And this symbolizes bitterness and suffering and affliction. And it means this. This baby would pay the ultimate price in giving his life as a ransom for all. The Christmas story is powerful. I could probably spend several weeks, as we obviously have, I could probably spend several more weeks talking about the Christmas story and um, the, the so many wonderful truths that come from it. But we're not going to be here all day. Everybody wants to go home. Uh, you guys have tolerated me long enough. And so I'm going to give you one final scripture um, to talk about the birth of Jesus there, and it has to do with a problem. There was a problem in heaven. The problem was this, is that God had this book, right? God had this book, and no one was found worthy to open it. And so before Jesus came and died, there is this eternal knowledge of God, this eternal status of God, this eternal relationship with God that creation longed to have, but the problem was is that nobody was found worthy to make that relationship happen. There was a book that's referenced in heaven called the Book of Life, and all of our names, those who are Christians, our names are recorded in the Book of Life, which symbolizes God's mind, and that this Book of Life has access to who is going to heaven and who isn't. And so you can see the divine problem, right? No one is found worthy to reconnect our relationship with God. No one is found worthy to help bridge the gap between our eternal salvation and so John is having this vision on the island of Patmos, and he begins to cry. 
The Bible says he begins to weep because he's seeing this story unfold as if it's actually happening, very real before his own eyes. He's seeing God sitting on the throne. He sees the access to God and the salvation of God, but it's impossible to take place because no one is worthy to take the scroll or the book from God. And then all of a sudden, he sees what he describes, the Lion of Judah, but he's also the Lamb of God. He's, he's a lion and he's a lamb. And the heavens begin to erupt in praise, and they begin to sing and rejoice, and they begin to sing a new song, a song that they have never sung before, because the lion and the lamb walks forward, and he is found worthy to accept the scroll. And look at this in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. It says the angels erupted and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain. You, were, you have purchased for God with your blood men of every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And John says, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was uh, myriads upon myriads and thousands upon thousands. And they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. A sevenfold announcement that this lamb was worthy, and it erupted louder than a stadium. Man, it would have been cool to see Jesus ascend to the throne, receive his rightful place, and all of a sudden, people actually now have access to God. We can read his word, we can pray, and we can take the Lord's Supper. Jesus is giving us this meal, which symbolizes not his birth, but his death the body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed that we might receive the forgiveness of sins. This is the most important meal that you'll have all day. And so as we take it, I want you to think about that. Think about the fact that God is so very worth your time this morning. Thank you for being here. God is so very worth your praise. Thank you for singing. God is so very worth your mind. Thank you for studying the scriptures this morning. God is worth your prayers. Thank you for praying. God is so very worth it all. Think about him and how very worthy he is. Let's pray. God, thank you for this meal. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the joy and the gladness and the happiness that it brings us. Thank you for angels rejoicing on the day of his birth and the heavens rejoicing on the day of his ascension, that he is a king and he is worth it all. God, I pray that as we take your bread, which is your body, and your blood, um, which is the cup of the fruit of the vine, Father, I pray that we'll remember the sacrifice that you made, that we are making a proclamation, Jesus reigns. Thank you for this meal. Thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for loving us. And thank you, God, for the joy of Christmas. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.